Good morning. This morning, rather than this passage scrolling across the screen to music, we're going to read it together because it is such a wonderful passage. I think it warrants being read. So if you turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 1, we'll read together. Please open your Bibles and keep them open while Steve's preaching. So we read John 1, 1 to 18 together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he who of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My wife, Ali loves detective novels and she's really good at figuring out who did it before she gets to the end. However, her habit has become about two thirds of the way through when she thinks she's got it, she'll flip to the end and read the end to find out. Of course, you'd never do that, would you? <laughs> and I'm going to do that with John's Gospel because John tells us very near the end of his gospel what he's doing. So if you've got a Bible to hand, have a look at the very end of John chapter 20, um, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John is telling us why he's writing. John is expressing his purpose in writing. And that's a really important signal to us as we read his book. John's writing, he says, to enable people to believe and he says that in two ways. He says these things are written that you may be, believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now there are two kinds of believing that are possible, aren't there? There's coming to believe for the very first time, like I did at the age of about 11. But there's also keeping on believing. And John, I think, is hinting at both. He's writing so that people who are not yet followers of Jesus can start to believe. But he's also writing to encourage and help those of us who are already believers in Jesus to keep believing and to, to be more confident in our believing. Now the next bit, I, I'd be inclined, I think, to translate just slightly differently to the standard translations. The NIV that you've got in front of you says that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. I, I prefer to flip the sentence round because I think the original more accurately says that the Messiah, the Son of God, is Jesus. 
In other words, the question John's Gospel is asking is not, who is Jesus? The question John's Gospel is asking is, who is the Messiah, the Son of God? And his answer is, it's Jesus. Now that means, as with the other Gospels, when you're reading John, keep looking for the identity of Jesus in this Gospel. Keep focusing on him. Because the Gospels are not books about us, they're books about Jesus. So keep saying to yourself, what's this author telling me about the man I follow? What's this part telling me about the Messiah and how Jesus is the Messiah? It also suggests that originally John wrote for people who knew what the Messiah was and wanted to know who it was. Now that suggests his initial audience included a substantial number of Jewish people, of course, doesn't it? So you've got John writing for, let's say, an audience that includes a substantial number of Jewish people. Now that makes sense of the vast number of echoes of the Old Testament scriptures that you find in John's Gospel. If you're Jewish, you, you, they're jumping out the page at you. And you're saying, gosh, I, I know this, I know this, I've heard this before. So if you've got one of those clever Bibles that has references to the Old Testament, where the Old Testament's being cited and you're reading John, follow those up. Go back to the Old Testament scriptures and look at what it's saying and then how John is showing you that Jesus is the fulfilment of all that God has been doing throughout the scriptures. But John's not just writing to inform people. He wants people to believe that Jesus, the Messiah is Jesus. But more than that, he wants people to, to, through believing, have life in his name. John is writing to inform his readers, but that in order that they can move into experiencing true life. It's a bit like the difference between reading the wedding service and thinking, oh, that sounds really nice, that sounds really good, and standing here at the front and being one of the two people who are committing themselves to it, and then living a life together as a couple. John's doing both. He's informing us about Jesus, but he's doing that to lead us to respond to lead us to respond through to, to Jesus. And his, this little phrase about having life in his name means true life. John sometimes, often, calls it eternal life. And by that he means a new quality of life, a new way of life that begins now and runs through death into eternity. It's a marvellous phrase that he uses. So look for that theme of life and what true life looks like. Let's now think about a different kind of detective. Do you remember the TV show Columbo? I'm seeing nods around the place. It was a very untypical TV show because your typical TV detective show, there's a crime, but we as the viewers don't know what's going on just as much as the detective doesn't know, know what's going on. So we, through the show, follow the journey of the detective until we, we see it at the same time the detective does. But in Colombo, the crime was committed. We saw everything at the beginning. We knew who did it, how they did it, what they did it, and so on. And then there's this shambling figure in this dirty old raincoat who looks absolutely chaotic, but is actually the brilliant detective. And our journey in the show is following his journey as he figures out what's going on. So we know right up front what's going on. That's how John writes his gospel. So have a look at the very beginning of John's gospel now. And let's look at how he does that. People sometimes call this a prologue to John. And in a sense it is, but I, I think it's more of a doorway. It's, it's a way in 
And in it, John is flagging up a whole bunch of things. So it's maybe a bit more like um, the, the, the piece that you get at the beginning uh, as an overture for a longer piece of music. And in an overture for an opera, for instance, you get all the major themes of the opera played over by the orchestra. Just very, very briefly. And then the rest of the piece will develop them very fully. That's what John's up to here. There are three sections here reflected by the paragraphs you've got in your, your Bible. And in each of them we're going to notice how God works with, in and through the Word. And we're going to look back particularly to notice echoes of the Old Testament scriptures and then forward into themes that John develops. Those first three words should be ringing all kinds of bells in the beginning. You're thinking of Genesis 1, aren't you? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and they're exactly the same words as the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This section of John goes back before creation, very different to the other Gospels. Mark starts with John the Baptist, Matthew and Luke start with the birth of Jesus. John goes back into eternity, to before the world existed. And the parallels with Genesis 1 go on in these first five verses. In, verse, uh, in Genesis 1-3, and six more times in Genesis, God said, God spoke and something happened. So Jesus is the Word. As God spoke the universe into being, Jesus the Word was with God. And through him, verse 3, all things were being made. Genesis 1-3 particularly says, God said, let there be light. Look at verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. Jesus is the true light. He comes to shine God's light into the world, just as God at the beginning spoke light into being. And then in Genesis 1, 20 to 24, God creates living creatures. And John here has said, in him was life, verse 4. Jesus is the one who brings not just biological life into being, that was the Genesis creation, but makes people alive in the fullest sense. They're alive to God through him. Then look on to verses 6 to 13, which is about the word and the world. And we meet John the Baptist. There's a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist was sent by God and his role was a witness to testify concerning that night. That's John's role. And, and John, John the writer is going to develop that. In verses 19 to 21, John gives testimony when the Jewish leaders send priests and Levites to ask who he was. And he didn't fail to confess, but confess really, I'm not the Messiah. And then in verse um, 29, he says about Jesus, look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Or in verse 34, he says, I've seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. John is somebody who, who's like a signpost. That's his role in John's Gospel, to point to Jesus. But the Word himself comes into the world, verse 9. And he's in the world, verse 10. Now, world in John is a big word, and it's got at least three sides to it. It can mean physical reality, as it does here. He, he came into the world, he came into the physical reality of world and left behind the glory of heaven. But more than that, the world is, is a body that God loves 
famously, the most famous verse in the Bible, probably, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But it's also a symbol of wayward humanity. And that's what um, verse, verse 10 is going to go on to say. The world did not recognise him. Indeed, later, Jesus says in, in 1518, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Now the difference is, is really stark because although he's physically in the world, the world itself doesn't recognize him. And strikingly in verse 11, he comes to that which was his own, the world that he created, but his own, and that's his own people, did not receive him. The people of the world are his when he created us. And people fail to recognize Jesus. The world divides. Some, verse 12, receive him. And they're the ones who believe in his name. There we are back at John 20, 31 again. That's John's purpose of, of persuading people to believe. And those people who receive Jesus, who believe him, he gives the right to become God's children. And their birth is a different kind of birth. It's not the kind of birth that you can see in a family tree. It's not the kind of birth that's a result of a twinkle in a husband's eye. It's not that kind of birth at all. And John's going to develop that point, notably when Jesus meets Nicodemus in chapter 3. Nicodemus, he says, you need to be born again. You need to be born from above. That's the kind of birth that John is inviting people into. A changed birth, a birth to a new life. So then finally, we get verses 14 to 18, where the whole thing comes to a climax. Just notice what's happened to the verbs. In, in the beginning of the passage, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God. Verse 14, the Word became something that he wasn't before. The Word became flesh. The Word became one of us. With these weak bodies that as we get older do less and less that they should be doing. These bodies that, that are fragile, bones that break. He became one of us. He became flesh. And there's a beautiful image hidden behind that little phrase in verse 14. He made his dwelling among <coughs> us. We might translate it, he pitched his tent. Um, and the metaphor that's being used is of the tent where God met people in the Old Testament. Remember in the period of the wilderness wanderings, God met with his people and he gave them instructions how to build a tent where he'd appear and meet people. And he appeared particularly to Moses and explained to Moses what he should do. God lived in a tent for many, many years. So Exodus 40 verse 35 says that Moses couldn't enter the tent of meeting because the cloud of God's presence had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Or Leviticus 26 says that I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. That that tent which marked God's presence among his people in the Old Testament scriptures is now there in Jesus. He has pitched his tent. He's come to live among us. And that's why we've seen his glory. Glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Jews, of course, had a festival that they called the Festival of Tabernacles. Tabernacles. 
when they lived in tents, they built temporary shelters and lived in them for a week. <coughs> and Jesus here is the fulfillment of all that that tent and that festival pointed towards. Uh, you'll find that John talks about the Jewish festivals a number of places through his gospel. And again, it's worth tracking that. He is the one and only, he's the one of a kind. There is nobody like him. So that although he's human and like us, he's not like us because he is the one and only son who comes from the Father. And John's testimony in verse 15 points forward to what he's going to say about Jesus. In verse 30, John's going to say, this is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. It's word for word what's there in verse 15. When John actually meets Jesus, he says, yes, this is the one that God told me about. And John, our writer, loves to do this. He loves to hint at something and then show us it more fully later. Four times in verses 14 to 17, John expresses what Jesus has come to bring. And the key word he uses is grace. So verse um, 14, he's full of grace and truth. Verse 16, we've all received grace in place of grace already given. Verse 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace is, is just a wonderful word in scripture. It speaks of God's generous giving to humanity in and through Jesus. God treats us with a kindness and a generosity that we absolutely do not deserve, but which he gives us freely in and through Jesus Christ. That's, that's what Jesus brings. And verse 16, you, you could translate it something like grace ladled over grace. Think, think of pouring chocolate sauce over ice cream and then pouring a second layer of chocolate sauce. That's what's going on. The most wonderful thing you can eat, well, at least that's my wife's view, um, the most wonderful thing you can eat, and then more of it. Grace poured over grace. And John finishes by telling us that Jesus is the unique revealer of God. No one's ever seen God, but the one and only who's himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. You can't figure it out by yourself. It needs God to reveal God to us. And Jesus is going to go on to say, in perhaps the, moment, the second most famous verse in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So he can say in 14.9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That is an astonishing claim. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. Now that's why we pray for our friends who aren't yet followers of Jesus, isn't it? Because we can show them Jesus with our lives and our words, but it needs God to open their hearts. No one's ever seen God. It's God the only Son who's made him known. This is quite a section, isn't it? This is, this is amazing stuff. It sweeps from the Word's relationship with God in eternity through to the Word becoming one of us in space and time. He was the agent of all creation. He, he, pour, he shines light on humanity. He's the one with authority to make people God's children. He shows us God's glory. He became human in Jesus Christ. And he dispenses grace and truth because he lives in intimate union with the Father and he reveals the Father to us. So as you read and learn from John over the coming months, keep your focus on Jesus, the Messiah. Keep your focus there. 
What's John telling you about him? What's John showing you about the way Jesus fulfills the scriptures in the Old Testament? And what response is John inviting you to make to him as the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who makes God known to us? Let's just pause for a moment and perhaps you'd like to just glance over this passage again and ask yourself, what response is John inviting me to make to this today? And then I'll lead us in prayer. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that you, as the creator of the universe, have made yourself known to us in becoming one of us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see as we read John's record of all that you are and all that you did that we too might be strengthened in our belief in you as the Messiah, the Son of God, and that we might more and more experience that true life that people who trust in you experience. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.